Okay, everybody, you're very welcome along to um, the Carl Historical Archaeological Society um, Heritage Week lecture at 2021. And we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Karen Dempsey back with us. She she gave us our last lecture before the lockdown uh, in February 2020 on Clonmore Castle, and it was very successful. Um, so we're really delighted to have you back, Karen. Um, and tonight, Karen is going to speak about Castle Gardens, Tinker Green in the Medieval World, um, and um, she's going to speak about the importance of gardening to medieval society, the role of gardens and castles, and how it's possible to create creatively research the plants that one grew there. Um, and I think we're going to have a little bit of a talk. I don't know if we're going to include a little bit about Ballylock and Ballymoon, Clanmore, I'm not sure, um, but we'd be delighted to hear it anyway. So over to you, Karen. Thank you very much. Great, thanks a million. I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm Dr. Karen Dancy. I'm based in NUI Galway and uh, very delighted to be here to talk to you today about castles and castles gardens. Um, so I'm a medieval archaeologist and I have long been interested in castles and I've found um, lots of different ways in which to think about them from daily life to uh, gender to women's role, but also like what buildings mean, what is architecture. But in the last while, I think, and, and maybe it's everybody's the same, I've begun to turn more towards plants in the garden. And I'm as interested in them in the contemporary world in my own in my own north facing backyard as I am with castles and architecture. And so it is a, is a real pleasure to be able to bring those two things together and also to, to return to talking about castle gardens. Um, thanks for the introduction. And like you were saying, um, I, my last lecture was in person. My last in person lecture was uh, in Carlo in uh, February or, or March 2020. And, it seems it seems like really long, long ago. Then I was talking about kind of the sensorial and emotional aspects of daily life in castles. And in, in a way, the garden is kind of linked into this. And you'll see as we're going through, I think that this talk in particular is, is, is really is really appropriate for Heritage Week because it brings together both natural and cultural heritage. And in a way, the things I'm going to be talking about today is, is kind of new because it's about green heritage. And if we can consider plants as parts of our heritage beyond the ordinarily kind of ecological or botanical aspects, but thinking of them as links to the past. Uh, earlier today, I was up at Castle Roach, which is not a castle in Carlo, but um, uh, some of the research featured in today's Irish Examiner. And, you know, it brings together plants people, women, castles. And I'd love to be able to do something like this at, at some of Carlo's really exciting castles um, because I think there's so much scope for research to be done in this way. So kind of to, to talk about, situate ourselves in, in, in space and, and in time. There's a picture of Carlo Castle there and Ballymoon, but I'm not really gonna talk about them today. So I'm gonna kind of bring ourselves back to the 12th and 13th century um, and a little bit into the 14th, I suppose, if we're talking about Clon Moore. And to think about castles and these large masonry structures that began to emerge in Ireland with the arrival of Anglo-Normans. We typically think that, that masonry buildings like this began with the arrival of the Anglo-Normans in Ireland. But there are, of course, other castles in Ireland um, constructed. And people use the term Gaelic Irish or pre-Norman in order to describe these. But as we're talking, you'll see 12th and 13th century is largely the period that we're going to talk about and, and concentrate on and the culture that, that surrounds castles at this time period. At first, what we're gonna do is talk a little bit about castle studies, about my angle coming into castles and spatial arrangement, which is really important because for the most part, that's the, the bit that survives, the most obvious surviving bit of the castles is the architecture. And after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about relict plants and what they are and how we can understand them and how we can use them to be able to understand castle life better. 
And I'll talk to you a little bit more about what they are as well. And of course, all of this feeds in together to talk about the castle garden. What was a garden? What was in it? What did a garden represent? And why it was important to medieval people? I feel like this next, next slide I've been talking about for ever so long because maybe it's, or maybe it's, um, maybe it's me, but for a long time, I think that castles and castle studies were, were incredibly male. They were really male dominated disciplines, like the study of castles. Um, and they really focused in on military aspects and large scale battles or um, um, things that were associated with warfare or economic concerns. Now, I'm not saying that they're exclusively linked to the male world, but it, it was the case that these large scale events were overly focused on. And what was lost was the daily life of people. And, you know, for the most part, battles were not occurring every day. And what we lose then is, is, is the, the, the the, the, the voices of people in the past who, who weren't um, lords sitting at the top of the table or who weren't knights out on the battlefield. And I think like my other work on the sensorial and emotional aspects of castle life, you know, these are the stories that I think most people are more interested in hearing about. Now, uh, that's not to say you don't have to know about the other things, because, of course, all of those parts of, of, of life interlink to form the medieval world. But it's not only me who kind of thinks, thinks in this way. Um, I, for last year, I was doing some work with Historic Environment Scotland, and they interviewed um, a wide range of people who were visiting their historic sites. And every the questions that people were interested in were not uh, warfare or um, how medieval people made money or how did this Lord do that? What they were interested in was what people ate, where they went to the bathroom, how did they get to work? How did they deal with the cold? And I think those are the things that we have to think about when, we're, when we want to explore castle interpretations and life and, and how we think about them and present them as monuments of the past in our contemporary world. Um, like this castle here, this is Treve, and uh, it's, it's, you know, 14th, 15th century castle. And within it, two women who were um, really, really part of the politics of early 15th century Scotland, Princess Margaret Stuart and her granddaughter, Margaret of Galloway. And they had occupied Treve, but they were totally absent from the story. And so Historic Environment Scotland went back and went through the, went through the historic record and they, they, they um, pulled out some really interesting information about Margaret. And you can see her here at the, the top of the table. And it places women back into the center of the story of Treve. And I think that that is something that, that we have to think about, putting the stories that are often untold back into, um, in, into the castle story. And one of those, of course, as I'm going to hear, is about the garden. So, when we talk about castles, a lot of the time we talk about architecture or increasingly we talk about landscape, but less is talked about is about, is about the garden. And that's quite surprising, even in, even in Ireland, where we don't have that many um, known surviving gardens. We do know that, of course, there were gardens at castles because Ireland was part of and participative in the wider Norman world at this time. And, and more than that, we have lots and lots of references to gardens. Um, and you can see here now, of course, I'm, I'm showing you the English translation of, of Latin documents. But again and again, the term garden comes up. And these are not fields. You know, they're very specifically gardens. Um, and they're all different types, gardens for herbs, fruit gardens. And I suppose I'm hoping that some of these are um, ornamental gardens as well. I think probably the most likely one would be, I've highlighted in red, there is Kilkenny um, under the castle um, where there's a garden. But unfortunately, I haven't found any references to gardens in Carlo, but I'm hoping that maybe at the end of this talk, somebody will be able to say, well, you know, Karen, I found this or I found that, or have you looked at this reference or have you looked at that? But even, even so, even if there is no historical reference, I think. You know, we have to go with the idea that 
um, gardens were part of castle architecture. And I'm going to show you how in the next couple of slides. One thing we know for sure is that castles had a particular layout. So there was a way in which the buildings were arranged in castles and the types of buildings that were in them. So we've come a long way from only seeing castles as, as pieces of defensive architecture built for or as a result of military con conquests or engagements. We now understand that castles are residences. And with that, of course, comes a host of other buildings that people would have needed to live in. Adair here is um, in, in County Limerick is a really good example of this. And so that's why I'm using it here. Um, I'm not sure, I'm hoping you can see my cursor if I move it over the screen. So with Adair, it's, it's, it's uh, outside Adair on the south bank of the River Maig. And you can, this is the river here. And we have a hole, two holes here, um, an inner ward, a chamber here, and an outer enclosure. And these are fairly standard things that you would have with the castle. Now, of course, with Adair, the timber buildings have gone and the, the timber fixtures and fittings are gone. And what we're left with is the masonry, as well as you heard me talk before about the textiles and all that that would have been inside the castle. But here we're just left with the masonry. But that's OK for, for what I want to show you tonight. And so at Adair, you have the hall, which is the ceremonial administrative center of the castle and it's also the space where the household ate together. Um, Adair is interesting because it has two holes, an early hall which is located here and this is likely belonging to it, this is potentially pre-Norman which makes it very unusual in Ireland and then a later one here early 13th, first quarter of the 13th century down here and with Paired with that, so that's kind of the, 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 the public face of the castle, where the Lord and Lady in their household would have sat and entertained um, guests as well as the wider part of the, the castle. And then we have the chamber here and up here. And this is the private space of the castle. It's where the, the Lord and Lady in their immediate family lived. And with the dare is really interesting because it, it's incredibly restricted here. You have to cross across the inner moat, which is this part here, go through a drawbridge and enter into this space here. And this really interests me. I was like, OK, well, out of there, we have all these buildings and, you know, we know that castles of this period came with a garden. Where's the garden out of there? And it got me thinking then about castles and gardens and what gardens look like. And one of the things we know about castles is that Typically, they do come with gardens with relatively high walls where present. Um, these are enclosed spaces. They're associated with the chamber. They're often intervisible or directly accessible. And within the garden, we have things like um, climbing plants, water features, uh, arch trellises with climbing dog roses, Rosa Camina, as well as uh, boxwood hedging, hawthorn, um, and brambles, which in in encompass a lot of other things. And a lot of the time, at least in England, we have latrine shoots which empty into the garden. And so, of course, medieval people were incredibly interested in composting because they reduced, they were the reduce, reuse, recycle people. You see that so often with old stone reincorporated or reused or older parts of older buildings being um, part of the castle, you know, Colchester in, in England was built on top of Roman temple. Now, of course, there's lots of other reasons for that. And we, we know that that happens in Ireland too. You know, Dunham Ace being built on an early Christian centre. Um, so uh, it's, it's, not, it's not only about composting, but it's a much part of a much broader idea. So at Adair, um, where, is, where is the garden? And so I think it's at this very central inner point um, associated with the chamber. It's, it's a much more private space. And the reason for this and why I started to become interested in it was in medieval culture, women and the garden are really associated. And the language around women's bodies, um, fertility is interlinked with the, word, the, the words that are used to describe the garden, fruitful, um, being one of them. And the Virgin, Virgin Mary, who's um, a role model for medieval women, was seen 
viewed as the hortus conclusus, the enclosed garden and her womb being the fruitful garden. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as you go on, but I just wanted to show you some examples of potential gardens in Ireland. None of these are conclusively identified or anything. Um, it's my archaeological work that's bringing these ideas to the fore. And just because, um, just because we haven't really explored them, it doesn't mean that they're not there. One of the projects that I've been really working on for quite, quite a long time is Lee Castle in County Leash, not too close from, not too far away from Carlo. And here we've done a number of different surveys and different projects and looking at the patron's architecture and trying to figure out how the immediate space of the castle worked and um, was used by, by people who lived there, as well as figuring out how the garden um, looked and was situated. And here too, we think it's beside the, the chamber, the residential space of the building and located in a place that was visible from the kind of elite residential accommodation, but also had beautiful views across the landscape itself. These things are not fixed, I suppose. We can never be certain about the garden because it, by its very nature, its trace is ephemeral. So, you know, turf banks or wooden trellising, all of these things disappear within the archaeological record. And so we have to kind of piece together um, I'd, I like to say evidence-based speculation to piece together the sort of um, more intangible things that might make up a garden. But one thing we kind of can be sure about is that gardening was ongoing in the medieval castle. We have a lot of pictorial evidence from manus medieval manuscripts, and these include like devotional, um, devotional books like uh, Books of Hours, or they also um, include garden manuals from the 13th century um, by Master John Gardner, and also uh, images such as this, where we have a lady uh, gardening with people gossiping around her. And I think this is a good way to think of the castle. So there's a lot of things going on, a lot of people around, but, but also um, carrying out these sorts of activities. And what about material culture? So, of course, I'm an archaeologist. I'm interested in the material trace. Yes, I, I do like to use supporting evidence from text or from um, liturgical items or whatever. But I, I, also, I also want to think about the objects people used and left behind. And again, here we have this issue because the material culture can be ambiguous. So uh, shears, which are an incredibly versatile object are used again and again for different things, from leather working to sheep shearing, from hopefully from gardening, but also in other things like obstetrics. So it's very hard to pinpoint its exact use. But I think if anyone has been gardening a good bit over the lockdown, like myself, you'll know yourself that your trusty garden shears is, is multifunctional in the garden. There is one thing that has been uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, that has excited me was the rose from a watering can that was found at Drisluan Castle in Wales. And this is the little top that you put on the end of a watering can. You pour and water sprinkles out. And so, you know, this is a really exciting find, like, because if somebody was living in a castle using a watering can, it means that there was particular plants growing there that needed particular attention. And we know from the historical sources that there were gardeners in England and in Ireland um, being paid to tend the garden, women as well as men. And this is, is a very tangible link to the past. And we can see from this imagery here that there's all sorts of plants growing. And we know as well that plants were growing in pots. Now, I'm using um, a lot of international uh, manuscripts, but still the widespread shared material culture of the Norman world was no doubt um, in Ireland at the same time. And we know that from the shared use of pottery and jugs and uh, castle building art, uh, castle builders and their architecture and their masons and everything. But here we have um, two uh, very obvious plants being put into pots. And so they are very, at a very developed stage. So I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to think about what was going on in the ornamental gardens. So gardens then themselves 
what was going on, what were they? And so castles definitely, you know, I've showed you from the historical references, there's a wide range of castle gardens and um, herbers and fruit gardens. Um, and we know that then that there were places of work, rest and play. And so what do I mean by that? So people obviously worked and tended the garden. There, and that includes from apple and pear trees down to things like broad beans and scallions and onions, which we find in the, in the archaeobotanical record. But there are also places where people rested, especially when you think about elite people or um, no, uh, re religious orders who um, part of their devotional activities was contemplation. And they sat in the garden as well. But of course, they were part of play. And I'm saying play here because it both can be, you know, children at play and household families at play. But gardens were a setting in medieval literature for, for lots for lots of, of plays, uh, for lots of drama. And they were this sort of ambiguous space because they were um, a space that was curated and tended to, but also kind of wild because, you know, the, the, there is a lot of green, there's trees, it's well leafed, and its association with nature lends itself to this sort of being a, a, an ambiguous space. And there's a lot of sexual imagery and metaphors being used with the garden, which again, I suppose, links it back to women and women's bodies and fertility. I'm not gonna talk much more about that today, but um, I, I have worked on that a good bit over the last while and have this, um, developed this idea about women and gardens, gardening as a devotional activity and sowing literal seeds. Um, in the hope of uh, aiding their sympathetic fertility. And you can ask me a few more questions about that because maybe it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's something worth thinking about a little bit more. So this idea of gardens and devotional spaces of contemplation, so they were part of the sacred geography of the castle. So like the way I was talking about, we see the hall and chamber and an outer enclosure of the castle as being key parts. But I think we need to reframe that. We need to um, imagine that the medieval world was, was, was the medieval people in their world were incorporating the garden into their castle architecture much more than we have previously appreciated. And in this way, then we'll, we'll be able to begin to, to explore that sort of intangible qualities of the green world that I've been talking about. If, um, if you're not so sold on this idea, let's have a look at uh, this, this description of Clairvaux. So this uh, Clairvaux is a Benedictine um, foundation from you know, the 10th, uh, 11th century in France. And here we see a, a um, description of how the, this, this, the sick man, the, one of the brothers who's sick, is interacting with the garden. And he's sitting there and he's looking at the leaves, he's sitting on a turf bench and he's breathing in the air and feeling the dappled sunlight come through the trees and he's marveling at the green world and it's going to make him better basically and here here it's it's so pronounced this idea of health and wellness and the garden being interlinked that we can't deny it now of course this um th there's no doubt that uh, this has religious and um um religious overtones, but also there's a, a bit of propaganda going on here, no doubt as well, like, and talking about, you know, their own religious order and how, how, how connected they are with God's world. But I do think we, 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 can't, we can't ignore how um, medieval people understood their relationship with the green world as beneficial. So it was this, this resting place. It was a place where they could gaze and, and be well. And this medieval wellness, this idea, like that isn't just a 21st century phenomenon. Medieval health practices and caring, they, they were really holistic. Um, and the, they, they're, they're, they're the sacred and, and the ordinary were really entwined and being well was, um, was, part, was, was, was linked to diet, was linked to movement, was linked to prayer was um, linked to having a good ordered life. And you know that, that's something I think that all of us can really relate to, relate to now. And we're certainly not the, the first people to, to think about those things. So like I was saying, like the, in the Middle Ages, plants were highly valued for, 
for this reason. They were, they were fragrant, they gave good smells to the body, which was crucial for wellness as well. Um, they had medicinal properties, and they were also thought to have mental and spiritual benefits. And you can see that all of that is captured in that excerpt from Clairvaux, where um, it's believed I'd just be being in the garden and contemplating that it can induce wellness. So I've talked a little bit about um, plants and how we can see them and how medieval people might have used them. And of course, you know, medieval people were making medicine. We have a lot of evidence of that, both um, material and literary. So, you know, we have things like decorated mortars for um, medicinal um, concoctions, uh, glassware for distilling. And this, this health practice was was really common um, in medieval monasteries and in castles and um, ordinary households as well. So you would have had people who were very well aware of the healing qualities of plants, both curated from the garden and perhaps gathered from the wild. And certain plants like um, meadowsweet, which we know was very common across the medieval world, has a natural occurring aspirin in it, so salicylic acid. So, you know, increasingly um, health sciences are turning back towards, I'm not saying looking for cures, but they're appreciating to a greater degree the understanding that, that medieval people had from their plants. Like a recent study in Trinity showed how um, crushed snail shells um, had curative properties and in lots of the rest, in, uh, lot, lot, lots of medieval recipes that the physicians of Modafi, who were these um, hereditary physicians working in in Wales, had always included, and I thought that was just amazing. Like, but anyway, back to the, the castle garden and what what sort of plants? So I talked about the space, what castles, what castle gardens might have looked like, where they were, what sort of what do we think of when we think of the medieval garden? But also, what sort of plants were we thinking about? Would they be, have been included? And it, there, so of course, there's native and non-native plants. So native plants are those which were not introduced and um, non-native are ones that are introduced. But it's, it's a bit tricky because they can be introduced at any point pre-1500, say. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, plants that, that were included in the garden. Between um, Neckham and Albert Martins, there are at least 144 historically attested garden plants and I've just I've just given you a flavor here but ones you know that that stand out as having medicinal qualities greater sanding chamomile of course and um, fennel garlic hemlock hembane house leek is a, a really interesting one because it has a dual purpose so it's thought to aid burns and scalds but it was also grown on the top of houses because it was thought to um, to uh, ward off fires that from lightning or, or other fires. And so when we're thinking about the medieval world, we have to appreciate that medieval people inc had um, this uh, sympathetic practices. So, you know, greater sanding might be used, uh, it, it being a yellow plant, to the, the middle left there, um, that it also was used for cures for jaundice or cures for kidneys. So, you know, the color yellow has, has particular associations. And things like um, yarrow, which is a, um, a, a native plant, but it also has medicinal qualities. But still, again, it occurs, uh, occurs widely still throughout the castle landscapes. Um, you, of course, I had to say because um, my 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 title slide is Huntington Castle, and you know that has the famous you walk, but you know it's probably not not eight hundred years old or anything. But we do see really old yews throughout, uh, associated with castles and 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 um, and medieval graveyards as well. They're not dated. And um, I was working with Dr. Fiona McGowan, who I'm going to talk a little bit about when I move on to the next part. And we'd love to do a, 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 an all island survey of use associated with graveyard and like they, they did in, in Scotland and come up with a kind of a general sizing guide to indicate age. But you would have been present in medieval gardens as well. So all of so basically what to take away from the things that I've been saying so far is that to try and research the archaeology of the castle garden is quite tricky because it, its trace is so 
um, is, is, is it's so hard to get an exact material trace of. There's all these indications. So there's a few indications with the architecture, some from historical sources. And I came across um, a study done by Dr. McGowan on relict plants. And I thought that this might be a really interesting way into thinking about the castle garden and how we might be able to understand it better. And so she did, Lee is the castle I was talking about at the, the start, where we think we might be able to understand where the garden is. But um, she identified yellow wallflower um, at the edge of the castle, or at, sorry, underneath the castle window. And she saw that it was a non-native plant who, who was imported from the, um, the Western Mediterranean. It was placed underneath windows to kind of act as an air freshener. And further research showed that it, it, it yellow has a significance in medieval culture. And from the 14th century, this particular yellow wallflower was worn either pinned on the breast or in the hat to indicate fidelity and to, um, to show that you were um, uh, kind of like a responsible knightly person. You know, and at, at this point, um, the, the chivalry culture was, was or courtly culture was, was quite prominent. And there's another couple of plants there now. Not all of them are, are non-native. And I was like, this is a really interesting idea. So we have plants that are being imported and we know that they have particular uses. You know, are there going to be more of these at, at castles and uh, around, around Ireland? And so basically then what emerged from this was at studies of relict plants, and it's the examination of modern landscapes for the presence of plants that may have survived from or been used during the medieval period. But not only that, it's plants that are present in particular locations that are non-native or rare to that location and absent from suitable surrounding terrain. And I started to do a lot more research on this and look at relic plants and you know, what other disciplines have been studying them and, and where, uh, where studies have uh, been focused. And it seems for a lot of, the, a lot of it, studies have focused on castles and monastic foundations. But of course, you know yourself, any time that you start studying anything and you think, wow, this is really novel, somebody else has been there before you. Um, and so when I started doing this with plants, I realized that you know, other work had been done in Ireland. And Donald Sinnott, who was the former head of the Botanic Gardens, had started to study relic plants, these, these plants I was talking about at medieval castles. And he had come up with eight plants that he believed were found in association with castles and religious houses across Ireland. Now, not all of these are imported or non-native plants. Um, um, Mm, which one is some of those are actually native so like pelletry of the wall and nettles um but it was a loose he, he was including kind of plants that were rare as well and of the most interest then was when i found this paper that had been um, done by a botanist in, in, in Wales, Anne Conley. And she had went to over 50 sites across Wales and looked at all of the plants that were there. And she found that there was such a high proportion of medicinal plants um, used in, in medieval recipes present at these castles and religious houses and completely absent from, from other areas. So they survived in stands at these sites. And so it points to medieval people being aware of and using these plants. And that's, you know, these very significant castles, Harlech Drizluin, where we found the, the water, where I, I talked about the watering can from before. Um, and all of these plants um, had really notable uh, um, medicinal value. So Wild Rocket in particular, I find this really interesting. So there was a, a medieval woman, Trotta of Salerno, based in Italy, who had written a, a, a whole book on treatments of women. And she, it's called um, the Trotula. And she had this 
recipe of for wild rockets to cure uh, pains association with menstruation. And this was translated into lots and lots of languages, in, 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 including Latin and, 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 and found in England. And so this idea then that there's people sharing this, this, this widespread med, this, this um, medicinal knowledge and including the plants, which are non-native. Now, I haven't found any of this in Ireland, so, you know, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we will. And that brings us to the next point, which is um, my work with Dr. Fiona McGowan's, which is the Sowing Seeds of Interdisciplinary Work. And here we researched for um, geographically distant culturally similar medieval castles, Carberry there, which I was talking about in Castle Roach, which I was talking about earlier, and Castle Cara. We wanted to see if there was any relic plant surviving in these castles. Now, the results are mixed, and um, I think what's needed is, is much more widespread study, and that's what I want to think about for the castles of Carlo. I'm just going to talk quickly about Castle Roach because it's such a fascinating place, and I've been working there all week. Um, and so it, it so we started with Castle Roach, and this is a 13th century foundation, spectacular castle, um, cited for maximum um, impact, built on this large rocky outcrop and this uh, flat plateau beside it. It's the only castle that has a name, a historically attested named female patron, which is Rovige de Verdun. Um, and there's lots of folklore and legend associated with the place. Um, including and 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 some historical sources. So the historical sources name a deserted medieval settlement, a borough, um, uh, sorry, a, a market and an annual fair. <clears throat> and it, that that's that's kind of the picture that we have of it built by a woman with an associated village and whatever. And I was like, oh, you know, that's really interesting. Um, how can we know more about the castle? And we started to do the relic plant survey. <clears throat> At it. And here we found milk thistle, mallow, pelletry of the wall. And milk thistle in particular is really exciting. It's very rare in Ireland and it doesn't occur so widely even in Britain. So it's, it's, it's um, survival at this castle is really significant. Where else does milk thistle occur? It occurs, uh, its, its name is associated with the Virgin. And you'll remember I said earlier this association with women and the Virgin. It occurs in the unicorn tapestries, which are a series of tapestries made in the Netherlands, but they have lots of religious symbolism related, related to um, fertility. And here we have it, the milk thistle included. And milk thistle itself is still used as part of um, uh, holistic medicinal therapy, and it's thought to also increase the production of breast milk in, for um, new mothers. And so we have all these little connections, these little ties. So was there someone at Castle Roach curating the garden, deliberately planting this and treating the, the local populace, or indeed perhaps Lady Ruizia, who married Theobald Walter, who built Nina Castle, whose family built Nina Castle, and who had five or seven children. We don't know, but I love the idea that we can connect these all together. At, at the other sites, the results weren't so great. And what we did at Carberry was we moved out beyond the immediate castle into the wider landscape. And here we found lots of really interesting uh, plants, including um, comfrey and knitbone and meadowsweet and pelletry of the wall. And I think that this has real potential for the other sites in Ireland. And I'm wondering, could this work, could this approach work in County Carlow? Because obviously we have in Carlow, you know, these really significant castles and there has been a little bit of work done on their, their architecture and landscape. But I think, you know, and I said this the last day, there's, there's so much scope and potential for extra work to be done at these sites. And I think this could, this could be a way in. So, you know, what, we have Ballylock in County Carlo, um, an enclosure castle, a little bit remaining. It was excavated, a, a gatehouse and a chamber and a corner tower remaining. The enclosure is, 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 is not so visible today. We know at one point from excavation that it had a moat. We know that there was 13th and 14th century material found there, pottery, a posy ring, a silver posy ring. And so there was obviously, this castle rule was obviously being used um, by people over an extended period of time. 
so how can we know more about this by looking at um, where the garden is? Can we identify any plants at, at Ballylochan or, or what sort of things can be revealed through an intense study of the landscape? So at the castle, you can see um, here, uh, just putting the, the plan over it. And so that has um, diminished somewhat over the, the, the last uh, number of years. Um, and so we don't have the, the hall and the chamber and the garden really, really visible. But in fact, we actually, we actually do. So we know that the hall and the chamber are associated. We know that the garden and the, the, the chamber tend to occur together. We know that castles of this elite level tend to have gardens and or designed ornamental landscapes. Well, can we see this at Ballylochan? So we know that that had the outer moat there. Is it, is there, is there, is it possible that the garden was associated with this chamber, which is what this building is down here? And this twin light window looks out over the castle landscape. Is it possible that the garden is situated along the southern boundary um, of, this, of this enclosure castle? Other uh, Tyke O'Keefe has also talked a little bit about the design, the potential for a designed landscape at Carlo, and he mentions this with the moated site that is here and other features in the landscape. And so the situation of the garden here spatially really works for that. It looks out over the landscape as well, or at least um, references, references that point. Okay, so that's that's one thing. That's about pinpointing using what we know of wider Anglo-Norman culture and, and or wider medieval um, castle arrangement and pinpointing a garden spatially. But but is there something more we can do beyond um, things like coring or or, or 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 analysis in that way? And so one of the things that we know about um, uh, land arrangement, the arrangement of, of the landscape, is that the townland boundaries and the parish boundaries tend to um, be reused and also to have marked their territories for much longer than, 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 than previously accepted. And at Ballylochan, we have that exact boundary very close to the castle. And I'm wondering if we started by doing a survey of the immediate of the, of the landscape, would we be able to pinpoint particular plants without doing extractive surveys um, in, in that landscape? We're probably not going to identify exactly what was growing in the castle garden, but I think it's worth thinking about the location of the garden probably along this area here, its, it's closeness to the moated site um, over here. And is there something that we can discern from looking at the wider landscape and examining the, the, the trees in the townland boundary or the plants that are growing in, in spaces that are relatively undisturbed. And I think this could also work for somewhere like Castle Moor. So Castle Moor, it's, a, it's, it's a, quite an overgrown moss, but it is still located very close to um, the, the Barney and townland and parish boundary. It had at one point a deserted medieval village, and it also had high status patrons, Raymond and, and Basilia. And they were likely resident at this uh, point in time. Uh, they were likely residents at, at Castle Moor. And, and there's an associated graveyard. So I think we're, we're looking at a landscape here that um, could, could certainly reveal more of um, what sort of uh, botanical legacies might be left behind in, in this area. And I would start, well, so like, obviously, um, this is with all proper permissions and talking with, with landowners and local communities and the national heritage agencies. But I think this could be a really exciting project, um, of course, to add on to all the work that's already been done here by um, Niall Brady and, and other people. And we could start by looking at uh, the townland boundaries and also closer to the moss itself and doing this relic plant survey and, and pinpointing exact what, what um, botanical features are found here. And of course, including the, the graveyard as well. So, um, you know, of course, things have changed over time, 
and uh, lots of uh, land management practices or modern interventions have changed landscapes. But there are still these plants that um, are botanical legacies of what was growing um, at castles in the past. And so you can see what I'm saying here. So uh, here's the Ordnance Survey map from 1840s, the first edition, and layered over that is the, um, the modern um, aerial image and we can see that there is quite a, look of course that's 200 years ago but I still think there's something really exciting about the survival in, 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 in large parts of this boundary and what we could see from the plant life that is there right now. I'll end um, just talking a little bit about Con Moore as well which I just think is is this I said Castle Roach is a really important internationally, um, an internationally important castle. And I also think Clonmore has, is a ve it's very important in Ireland's story. And I'd love to, love to do some more research here. So here we have um, an image uh, looking west, the aerial image and the, the view from the north where there is a water course along the back of the castle. Um, I've been talking about where we can think about the gardens are in all of these spaces and what we should be looking at. And at, at Clonmore, we have a large enclosure castle with the residential accommodation situated along the eastern side. Um, the, the, the original gatehouse is no longer there and the south wall of the castle is missing. And so this is a, this is a loose general plan of the castle with the first edition uh, ordnance survey maps. And I, I'm not saying that the castle was like this in the 1400s, but it's a good indication perhaps of what may have changed over time in the castle. And there's something very interesting. So like we have the, the residential accommodation here and we know that there's the enclosing wall here, but the, the south wall is gone there if it ever existed and or was it built of wood. But perhaps there's, there's room to imagine the garden being here right beside this high status residential accommodation with the hall at the end here. But more, I think, is, is one of the more unusual buildings because at this point it has the hall probably at first floor level. And it's something that we don't really see. So it is um, it doesn't conform, shall we say, to what we, what we would expect. And so maybe the garden could be some, somewhere located along here. Like um, it's very hypothetical in this situation because so much of the castle is gone. So you know, we could have it coming out here on an east-west axis or perhaps more likely tucked in here when we see these buildings that are no longer extant. A lot of castles also, as a caveat to say, a lot of castles were used in, as um, as sort of, uh, they were used and uh, smaller cottages were put into the, the, the castle area because of course it, it was a very good space in, in which to build your, your cabin. So perhaps that's what these buildings are here. But, the townland boundary here, and of course, you know, we have the association with Castlemore, with the with um, we have the association with 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 Clonmore, with the, the medieval garden, medieval graveyard that was already established there, and these two things still survive very obviously in the landscape today. So we have the the townland boundary here, and we have the medi the sorry the townland boundary here, and the medieval enclosure here, and I really think that it would be of great interest for the botanical legacy of the castle and its wider landscape to do a kind of a relic plants survey in this area. So this is kind of a whistle stop tour, I suppose, of the what I think about the medieval garden, why I think it's important, what sort of plants we find in them, but also how we can apply this to uh, Carlo castles and their wider landscape. Um, I'd be really interested in, uh, tr in, in, tr in definitely trying to do some of this, this research, um, especially at, at Clonmore. Uh, you know, I had such a lovely time talking the last time, and I'm sorry that this is on Zoom, but you know, thanks so much for the, the Carlo Historical Archaeological Society for inviting me, and uh, I look forward to, to chatting a little bit more about the gardens. Thank you. Thanks very much, Karen. That was that was excellent. Really, really interesting. Um, if anybody would like to, to um, ask a question, please you can just put up your hand on the on the um, on on the uh, the I think it's in the reactions. Yeah, if you put up your hand in the reactions or clap in the reactions, I'll pick it up and we'll call you in. Or um, 
you can do it also by the by the uh, the chat option. And just I'll read you out. We got one on the chat um, from Blanca McDonough. Hello, Blanca. Um, she says she's loads of milk thistles in my garden over the summer. A few grew in pots left by the previous owner, and a few grew in the backyard. Didn't know they were so rare. I live in an old farmhouse in Old Lachlan. Wow. Uh, yeah, they're super. I don't know, like, so they're, what I meant was that they're rare uh, growing in the wild. Um, I don't know if they're rare growing in people's gardens, but um, yeah, be interested to, to hear more about that, actually. And are they actually milk thistle? You know, like, because they have those really distinctive white veins going through it, which is meant to be, is meant to be the, the milk of the virgin, right? Because Marianum is, is about Mary, so... Yeah, um, I had a, uh, a botanist here that was not too long ago, and he told me it is a roof milk thistle. Roof milk thistle. Oh, that's I great. Had it, I had identified on, on, on Google first and on my on my app on the phone because I found it was so interesting because it was really high. I have a few mm. of, of those. They're really high, like they're they are larger than I am. And the one is um, in, the, in, in, in the backyard and two were growing in, in pots. Like I, I inherited the flower pots and everything. And those were the ones which I didn't throw away, thank God, but because they're absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's really, that's really great. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to love that picture. Picture them if you want to, send, if you want to send me them. Yeah, no problem. We'll do that. Uh, anybody else got any questions you'd like to, to ask oh. while we're here? Lynn, Lynn. Wants to come in there? Um, uh, yeah, thanks, yeah. Uh, John. Thanks, Karen. Fabulous talk. Um, brilliant job. I love the way you've, you've you've approached all that and how how great you you came up with your deductions and were able to to share it with it was fabulous. Um, is there anything that public could help you with? You know, you're 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 onto a crowd here who spend their time round and round these places. Is there anything public could do or send you in stuff or take photos of of plants or what what what, what should we look for? Well. I like so that's I I mean so I'm not a botanist um I am interested in plants I worked with Dr Fiona McGowan on this and I I don't know I think I would love to do I would love for there to be um this is the idea I have so that we would have an, an app or some way in which we could have a plants recorder, whether it's paper or not. And that when people are out, they would record certain things at sites or maybe like a series of 10 small printed cards. And when you go like, you know, so, so many of us go to historic sites now, you know, I know if you had a castle or whatever in your 5K, you were going, probably going down there every single day. Mm -hmm. And it'd be great at different times of the year that people uh, noted which sort of plants were flowering or present or whatever. And like, of course, I know that there are um, already things like this happening, like the bio blitz when people go out in 24 hours, they record every single thing that they can see in their in their back backyard or something. But yeah, I mean, I haven't, I would like to do something, but I haven't thought about it on such a large scale. But I think it is, is something, um, you know, like, so for too long, right, uh, natural and cultural heritage are always seen as separate. And I think this idea of plants being um, relict from the past, past, they're being active living heritage and, and being green. And, and it's so much important for climate change that we all attend to this sort of world. I do think that there is something here for a big project, maybe not not run by me, but maybe like you're saying, like uh, local communities taking the, the bit between their teeth and running with it. Yeah, I think you could have started something, Karen. So <laughs> well done. But absolutely, you can imagine the database that could potentially be developed, um, you know, that could contribute to, to lots of researchers, hopefully, as well, you know. But it definitely started and, and, something very interesting. It's a lovely angle, Karen. Yeah, well I, I like, and I know that um, uh, the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland have an active database where you can log finds to that and you know that was that was where I gathered some of the data from this and how I know milk thistle is rare also my my brother and sister-in-law are um are uh, very keen botanists so um you know that helps too. that helps too but yeah. but but on a you know so maybe there's some way maybe there is something that's already there that we could tap into in yeah. um so to not to reinvent the wheel but to kind of use the the infrastructure that's already there to build this into 
the the build this into into medieval research or like you know research like archaeological research in that way something like that yeah yeah brilliant thanks karen and thanks again for the talk it was brilliant Aaron the Nobber Heritage Centre sends their regards and they really enjoyed the lecture. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Dr. Sharon Green, who was a good friend of Carlo Historical and Archaeological Society and a great um, uh, representative of Castle Dermot and Castle Dermot history, wants to say hello, Sharon, how are you? Hey, how are you keeping? Um, Karen, really exciting research as usual. Um, I knew I wasn't going to be disappointed. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, I, I don't even know where to start. I mean, I think the potential for what you're doing is massive. And I, I, I absolutely see, and, and it's really interesting, I think it was Lynn spoke there before me, the, this crowdsourcing and sort of citizen science kind of approach mm. could be really, really productive. Um, but two things just came to mind. One is milk thistle. Again, um, there's an early ecclesiastical site, which was became a medieval site, uh, Dunman Oak, not very far from my house. And when I went onto that it's now looked just like a graveyard in a field um, but I visited that site a few years ago and it was covered in these strange thistles with white veins that I wasn't familiar with <laughs> which wow. I suspect now are uh, milk thistle so that's interesting um, but the other thing someone told me recently uh, about a survey that was done of hedgerows in Kildare um, I don't know if you if you ever came across it looking at I don't know if they were just looking at the trees or all the plants in general and I think that's held in the county council somewhere. Uh, there was a number of studies done with the hedgerows first of all the milk thistle thing that's great uh, you know I'm from Kildare uh, yeah. so I'll go and have a look at that. Um, the other Give thing me a the, yeah, <laughs> the other thing about the hedgerows uh, yeah so so there were studies done of hedgerows and it was something about um, you, you take a 20 meters and you would measure the amount of um, species present and using that as an indicator of age. It was about trying to date some of the townland boundaries. And I and I also think that that's still something that would be interesting to do on a greater scale. And also because so little research has been done on townland boundaries archaeologically um, being notoriously hard to date and whatever. Yeah somehow again, all the things fitting together, I think. Thanks, thanks for your questions and for sharing the milk thistle. <laughs> thanks. If everyone's like me and they're super tired, <laughs> that's okay. Um, you can uh, you can email me and uh, any questions. That's that's no problem. Or pictures of the, of the unusual plants or whatever. Uh, especially if you're you're down your local um, graveyard or whatever, and you you see something unusual, I'd be very happy to to receive that information. Thank you, Scott, John, you're on mute there. Sorry. Sorry, I, I, I have a big problem with mute. <laughs> um, I just like to ask uh, Dr. Shemi Omorku to come along and just um, to just give a, a vote of thanks. Sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks, a million, Karen. Like at the outside, outside of the lecture, you said. Uh, it would bring uh, together natural and cultural heritage. And I think we certainly got that tonight. There was something in that for everyone. I don't think anybody thought they were going to be coming away with a job after tonight as well. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we got a tour of not just medieval Ireland, but even a little trip to Scotland and France as well. Um, I'm sure everyone will have a newfound appreciation for castles um, and will be looking at them very differently. And there's a saying that, you know, the past is uh, a foreign country, that they do things differently there. But your talk tonight almost made the medieval past and the medieval people seem familiar, even just with recycling, gardening, and just the appreciation for nature. And I shared an office uh, with you for four years and saw from, you know, some of the early stuff, you know, your surveys of the medieval buildings themselves, uh, your geophysical surveys and your search for those elusive uh, hall houses um, <laughs> and it still amazes me that despite the huge amount of uh, research that you've put in over the years and um, that you still find new approaches and new ways to investigate these sites uh, so on behalf of everyone here tonight 
both on Zoom and uh, over on Facebook, as I know there's a few, I checked there, there's a few people uh, watching us there. Um, thank you for um, taking the time to speak to us and for preparing a brilliantly illustrated presentation. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Jamie. That means so much to me. Really, uh, thanks so much. I'd like to, just on behalf of society, just like to thank Karen again for coming along. Um, she's been, she's been excellent. Her last talk was excellent. I think this one was even better, um, and we really enjoyed it. And hopefully, we can get you back again soon. Um, maybe after you've done all the Carlo Castles, and and um, <laughs> we can we can talk then. <laughs> So thanks very much, and thanks everybody for attending. Um, just to let you know, um, our our first lecture I think this year is in October, and it'll be Adam Kane who will be speaking about um, Carlo and, and the War of Independence, with a particular emphasis I think on policing. So we look forward to seeing everybody then, and thanks everybody.